This is a 1987 Porsche 944, and it's wonderful. <laughs> Porsche people will tell you it's not a 911, and they're right, but this car is still fun, exciting, thrilling to drive, and surprisingly affordable, and it deserves more love than it gets. Today, I'm going to give it that love, and review the 944, and show you all of its quirks and features. <laughs> Before I get started, big news, this Porsche 944 is currently for sale and it's being auctioned live on cars and bids. This 944 has some fantastic recent servicing, a manual transmission, and an accident-free Carfax report that shows it's mostly been here in California its whole life. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this 944 where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the 944, and I'm going to start with an overview of this car. The 944 was Porsche's entry-level model in the 1980s. Much like the Boxster and Cayman are the entry-level Porsches today, this had that place in the Porsche lineup back then. The 944 evolved from the Porsche 924, which came out in the late 1970s. Interestingly, the 924 was co-developed by Volkswagen and Porsche. It was going to be a top-of-the-range sports car for Volkswagen or potentially Audi, and then also an entry-level car for Porsche. So they split the development costs, but then late in the project, Volkswagen decided they didn't want to be a part of it anymore, and Porsche kept it going and took it to the finish line and came out with the 924. But development was already so far along that the 924 was built in an Audi factory, not Porsche's plant in Stuttgart, and the same was true with the 944 as well. Not technically a a Stuttgart built Porsche. Now, like I mentioned, the 944 came out in the very early 80s and was sold through the very early 90s, and it's become kind of a symbol of 1980s Porsche since it was sold basically that entire decade. Now, this particular 944 is an S model, which was a later production version with more power. The 944 originally came out as just the Porsche 944, but then after a few years, they came out with this, the 944S, a sportier model. Now, all 944s used an inline four-cylinder engine, but the early cars had about 145 horsepower, not a huge figure. The S upgraded that to 190 horsepower. Still not massive, but this car only weighed 27, 2800 pounds. It was always very light. So 190 horsepower should make it pretty fun to drive. We'll get on that in a little bit. Now, by the end of 944 production in the early 90s, the S model, which by then was called the S2, was making about 210 horsepower, and the base 944 was up to 165. So power sort of steadily grew throughout this car's production run. Now, in the early 1990s, Porsche was facing some changing regulations, particularly pedestrian safety, front end design, and they also wanted to modernize the car, which had been on sale for 10 years, so they came out with an updated version called the 968. This car was originally going to be the 944S3, but late in its development, they decided to change the name, drum up some excitement for a brand new model, even though it was really just another evolution of the 944. The 968 also had a 4 engine, though it was a 3-liter four-cylinder, and you can see the resemblance, the 968, just a more modernized, updated, upgraded version of the 944. Now, it's also worth pointing out there were other versions of this car. A high-performance 944 Turbo was also offered. In fact, I recently reviewed a 944 Turbo, and it was quite a thrill to drive. There was also a Cabriolet model, a soft-top convertible 944, that was offered as well. Various different configurations, engines, the result was a big success. Porsche made over 160,000 944 models during its production run, and over half of those came here to the United States. Porsche's huge market, big following in the States, especially for this car. 
But anyway, next up, onto the quirks and features, starting with the key, which has an interesting quirk. You flip over the key, the backside has a button. Is that the lock button, the unlock, the alarm? No, it turns on a light. This little light here, mounted on the key, would turn on when you pushed the button. Unfortunately, it no longer works, but the thinking was you'd walk up to the car at night, you couldn't see the keyhole, you'd press the button, it would shine on your door, you'd see the keyhole, insert the key, and unlock the door. It was an interesting idea, and actually quite a few cars from this era had a keyhole, button, and light. More interesting on the subject of keys, the fact that you can see two keyholes here. There's one on the door handle, and then there's another one behind the door. So you're thinking, did someone install an aftermarket second keyhole in this car? In fact, no. This is one for the deep, deep Porsche files. This car came with the factory alarm system, and that gave you the extra keyhole. What would happen is you'd get out of the car, lock the door on the normal keyhole, and then using a different key, you would arm the alarm with the other keyhole. So two keyholes for two purposes, and it was factory built if you got the optional alarm. Very unusual to see that, and especially unusual to see an extra keyhole not on the door, on a rear fender. And next, we move inside the 944 for the interior quirks and features. There's a surprising amount of quirks in here, which is unusual for a Porsche. Normally, they're built very functional and simple without unusual touches, but this car has some weird ones. Starting on the door panel, the power mirror control. You can see it's right here. You move it up, down, left, right, and it moves the mirror, which seems pretty simple until you realize it only moves the driver's mirror. So how do you adjust the passenger mirror? The the answer is there's a switch in the center console next to the gear lever that changes which mirror you're adjusting. You flip the switch and you're adjusting the driver's mirror, flip it the other way, and suddenly you're adjusting the passenger mirror. For some reason, they didn't think to put this switch near the actual mirror control itself. Instead, it's in a totally different place, so much that you might think you only have one power mirror, but you don't. In fact, these switches here in the center console is kind of a weird hodgepodge of controls they couldn't seem to find another home for. You have the power sunroof, you press that, and then the sunroof tilts open for a little bit of a breeze in here. Of course, press it the other direction, it closes again. You also have the rear windshield wiper, the power mirror selector switch, and then the power locks. Those are your central switches. They don't really correspond to each other, but they're all in this place. However, the weirdest control in this car is undoubtedly the trip odometer reset set button. Okay, so take a look at the central climate vents. They look like fairly standard central climate vents, except the one on the left is rather small. That's because it isn't a climate vent. Instead, the button in the center resets the trip odometer. It's a dummy climate vent with a dummy climate vent control whose function is actually the trip odometer reset. For some reason, they decided to hide that and make it look like a climate Event, certainly one of the quirkiest quirks you'll find in just about any car. And further on the subject of interesting controls, another weird one is the headlights. The headlights switch to the left of the steering wheel, you twist it, and then a warning comes on in the gauge cluster to tell you your parking lights are on. You twist it a second time, and then all warning lights go away. Nothing tells you that your headlights are on, and that's because well, you can see it. This car has pop-up headlights and they pop up. And that is your only warning that your headlights are on. Instead of some dashboard warning light like every other car has, Porsche figured you're not an idiot. You can just look and see that your headlights are on and you don't need a warning light to tell you that. And yes, pop-up headlights, this car has them. They are cool, wonderful things. A very 1980s quirk or feature, and when they're down, as you can see, the car has sort of a sleeker, more aerodynamic look, but when they're up, it's very, well, headlighty up front. Next up, another interesting touch in here, a nice one, the sun visors. You put them down, you can see they extend all the way, well, to each other, meaning that they cover the entire middle area of the windshield. So there's no exposed part of the windshield above the rear view mirror like in some cars. Your entire surface area is covered, which is smart thinking. Also interesting 
in here is the steering wheel, which you can see is this very horizontal affair. Two horizontal bars going across, and then it says Porsche in the middle. Not exactly the most attractive steering wheel, but it was a very 1980s Porsche wheel they used in a lot of models and very distinctive for this car. Finally, last item worth noting up front, the transmission. Mentioned the gear lever before, you can see manual transmission. This car has a five-speed manual. Interestingly, you could get the 944 with an automatic, although very few were sold that way. Of course, the manual is the desired enthusiast transmission, and this car has it. Next up, the back seats. Yes, the 944 has back seats. Despite being very small, entry-level Porsche, 2,700 pounds, you get back seats, and you can see they are tiny. Two individual seats back here, no center middle seat, very heavily bolstered and incredibly small. No one will realistically be able to sit back there, but the seats are there for small people or big people for a short time, and you have a little extra practicality in your 944. And next up, moving further back in the 944, I'm going to get into the cargo area. But before I get in there, I want to talk about some interesting quirks and features back here, starting with some regulatory ones. The bumpers, for one, you can see the bumper protrudes out from the body of this car several inches beyond where the body ends. And then even beyond that, you have these black plastic pieces, left and right sides, that protrude even further, another inch or an inch and a half beyond the already protruding bumper, and it's the same deal up front. You have a bumper that sticks out from the front of the car, and then plastic pieces that stick out even further. Of course, this was regulatory, and it certainly changes the look of the car, adding all of this extra bumper in back, but they had to do it for compliance purposes to make sure the car was legal to sell. The other interesting regulatory item back here is the third brake light, which is stuck here at the top of the rear window. This was an add-on during the 944's life. The U.S. government started mandating third brake lights. It was either 86 or 87, so early 944 models from the early 80s don't have it, but this car, being an 87, does have it. They just kind of stuck it on there in the window instead of incorporating it into the design because, well, this car wasn't designed with that brake light in the first place since the regulation didn't exist at the time. Other interesting items back here, the Porsche script below the license plate going across the entire entire car, it says Porsche in large, wide print. Feels very 1980s. And just in case you've forgotten, it also says Porsche here on the rear spoiler, imprinted into the rear wing Porsche. And by the way, this rear wing, it's like rubber. You can feel it moves. It's not plastic. It looks plastic or maybe even metal, but it is in fact rubber. Very interesting look and feel and design for the rear wing in this car. And speaking of Porsche on the outside, it also says it on the door handles. Porsche. Again, just to make sure you knew exactly what you were getting into in case you hadn't seen it in the back where it's printed twice. But anyway, getting into the cargo area, to get back here, you gotta stick the key in and twist old school style, and then the rear window lifts up and you can see the cargo space, which is actually surprisingly large, wide, flat space back here, and it's completely open with the front of the car. So if you have something really long, you could stick it through to the back seats, and even through to the front seats if you really needed something huge moved in your 944. It was actually a reasonably practical hatchback, dare I say. And speaking of practicality, it even included a cargo cover. This black leather cover, you'd pull it out and clip it in place, and then it would cover up your cargo, just like what you'd get in a modern day SUV or hatchback or wagon. One other interesting item in this cargo area is the hump. Towards the rear of the car, you can see this hump in the cargo area, which it's pretty clear what it is. That's where the spare tire is located underneath the cargo floor. That spare tire shaped hump is there to accommodate the spare tire in this car, which was there when you needed it. You had a flat, you knew where to look. All right, driving the 944. And I gotta say, I always love to drive a 944. It has such great vintage Porsche vibes in here. I laugh at the steering wheel because it looks ridiculous, but this is how old Porsches look. And this car is how old Porsches feel. Everything is just like nice. You get, you drive this car and you feel like sturdy in this awesome, like, old-school German car way, and I love that. And the other thing I love is throwing a 944 around corners, because here's the thing about this car. 
it is slow. I'm at 5,000 RPM right now and it's like, <laughs> but it's fun. You can just jam on it and really beat the hell out of it and really ring it out. <clears throat> and it's amazing. And more importantly, it is so balanced in corners. You know, everybody with a 944 talks about the fact that some magazine back in the 80s said that this was like the best handling car. Uh, and that's like the thing. And I, you know, you know, Road and Track in the December of 84 issue said the 944 better, better handle it than 911. People say that who have these cars. And you know what? I'm making fun of them, but they're right. <laughs> this car just drives great. It, it handles incredibly, incredibly well. The steering is good, for, especially for a car from this era, the mid-late 80s. It's like impressively good, but the handling is just fantastic. The car stays flat. It just, it, it feels wide and like ready to go as fast as you want around a corner. Now, of course the car, you can't take it that fast around a corner because it's a 944. It doesn't really go that fast, but this car is just so much fun to toss and throw and really, really get on and enjoy. That's the cool thing about the 944. These cars are underappreciated because they made a lot of them. They're not 911s and because they weren't very fast. But I'll tell you, if you just want like a cheap, fun car, Miata's great. This is also great. And I think that more people ought to really consider these because this is one of the coolest damn cars, especially at this price point. 10, 15, 20 grand, depending on the condition. You get a turbo, it's not even that much more considering what you're buying. I think these cars are just a hoot and man, they're just so solid. And you just feel like you wanna be steering it for days. Oh no, 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 I wasn't ready. This is the problem with this car. It's just not what I would call fast. But I don't know, is that really a problem with this car? Like I think that for the money that these cost, you kind of understand, hey, it's like, it's like punchy, but it's not fast but it's just fun. And again, it has this vintage Porsche feel, the driving feel, the heaviness of the steering, the heaviness of everything in this car, except by the way, for the clutch. The clutch and shifter, like in all Porsches from this era, just feel great. Porsche knew how to make a fantastic manual transmission, and this is that, a fantastic manual transmission. Easy to rev match, easy to get the clutch in and do some shifting. It feels so, so, so nice to drive this car. Seriously, the gear lever, gear action is fantastic. The, the shifter especially is really, really nice. It just feels buttery smooth and yet notchy enough that it's like right. It's just like the perfect uh, combination of everything. You buy a 911 from this era and it's now an ex incredibly expensive car. Here's a car you can actually really drive. A Porsche from this era you can drive to its fullest and feel no guilt at all. There's something pretty cool about that. Overall, is this the best Porsche? Of course not. It's just damn cool. And it's starting to throw off these vintage Porsche vibes that are just becoming so expensive in other Porsche models. And you gotta wonder, won't 944 values go up eventually, just like 914 values did, because ultimately this is a Porsche and a rising tide lifts all boats. And the secret is kind of out that these cars are fun to drive, even though for years they've been, you know, people complain, oh, they're slow, oh, it's the base model, not a 911. But yeah, well, 911 is now a hundred grand. So here's an old, a way to get an old Porsche and still have fun. And I gotta assume the market's gonna continue to appreciate these cars more and more as time goes on. And so that's the Porsche 944. This car isn't that fast, but it's fun. You can get behind the wheel, push it hard, really ring it out and have a good time. And it's a Porsche. It may not be the vaunted 911, but it's still cool. And frankly, a lot cooler than most other cars you can buy at this price point. Anyway, now it's time to give the 944 a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 47 out of 100, which places this 944 here against some other similar cars. The 944 is slow to be sure, but it's also got a lot of benefits. It feels like an old school vintage Porsche in a great way. It handles absolutely fantastically, even all these years later, and it's a total bargain for what it is. The 944 will never get the admiration that a 911 will, but you can have guilt-free fun with it driving at the limit. And I love that.